It's Friday afternoon. We've locked the door to keep the roving hordes away from our secret stash of extreme strength hand sanitizer, and also because it's time for another edition of our weekly podcast, Tales from the Brown Desk. I'm Jake Rigney of Rigney Law, LLC. With me, as usual, is my law partner, wife, and real-life fruit ninja, Cassie Rigney. See, all you guys, you're good at it on your phone. She does it in real life. Our host is Terry Ulm. Friendly reminder, Tales from the Brown Desk is a free-flowing conversation involving two foul-mouthed attorneys. It may include graphic descriptions of sexual activity, violence, and nature's purse. It may not be suitable for children, toddlers, baby lumps, expectant mothers, sensitive houseplants, Christian conservatives, snowflakes, or the cancel culture. Listener discretion is advised. Here's Terry. Hello, everyone. Hi, Jake. Hello. Hi, Cassie. Hi, Terry. How are you Tuesday? Fine. My fingers are sticky. I had a couple of chicken wings for lunch, <clears throat> and I apparently didn't wash my hands. <gasps> Uh-oh. Coronavirus everywhere on everything. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's how it works, but... Well, you can get it from chickens, right? You can get it from tigers. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Tiger King. (laughs) Um, So we are going to do a follow-up question from last week's episode, and it was in regards to the nonviolent civil disobedience. Oh, good. Now, one of the things we didn't cover, which was a question that was brought up, was the possibility of being charged with resisting law enforcement. When can those charges be brought against somebody? Let's say, for example, that this activist or an activist is not listening to the cops and not going along with being arrested and are just sitting on the ground and has to be dragged away. Could they be charged with resisting law enforcement? It depends on on what they do. Um, I I assume you've talked to them since last week, since our last episode. Yes. Um, And so it also sounds like they have no intention of taking my advice and uh, not getting arrested. Is that accurate? That is accurate. There are people that plan on being arrested. Okay. Just like the rest of my clients. So it's great. (laughs) Um, Not really. None of my clients (laughs) wanted to get arrested. Um, Nothing like actually any of my other clients. Um. So you you can get arrested for resisting law enforcement um, in sort of two different general ways. The first is by running. So if you flee from the police, you are committing a crime. Uh, and so if any of them, when, when they're doing this, the police say, okay, you're under arrest, they decide to get up and run, like, and if they do, I really hope that they use an old-timey voice when they do it and say, you'll never take me alive, coppers! <laughs> <laughs> but if they don't do that, uh, but they run from the police, uh, they'll get charged with resisting law enforcement. That's an A misdemeanor, resist by flight. If they did it in a car, it would be a level six felony. And it gets worse uh, if, you, if you do it and it results in someone's death or serious bodily injury, I think. Um, especially to a law enforcement officer. Um, But there's a second way you can get arrested for resisting law enforcement. That's resisting by force. Um, There have been several Indiana appeals court opinions about what exactly that means. Um, And it's, uh, it can be very tricky. Um, If you, first of all, there are the obvious easy ones, right? If you punch the cop, Uh, that's resisting law enforcement. In fact, that's probably going to be worse than resisting law enforcement. But if you push the cop away, if you try to yank your hand away from him while he's trying to put you in handcuffs, he or she, um, that's resisting law enforcement. You're using some type of force to prevent your apprehension, to prevent them from doing what they're lawfully allowed to do, which is arrest you for committing a misdemeanor. But it gets trickier the the less force you use, right? Um, and so the appeals court has said that simply tensing up and refusing to let the officer sort of put your hands behind your back is still enough. 
right? So even if you're not pushing, you're not fighting, you're not spinning away, but you're flexing your muscles in a way that makes it harder for the officer to cuff you, that's force. But they have not gone so far as to suggest that if you just lay there limp, you just sit there limply, um, that that is resisting law enforcement. Now, you don't really want to have to make your case go all the way to the Court of Appeals to find out the answer to whether that's resisting law enforcement or not. So again, like I've said repeatedly before, I don't encourage you to do anything that would cause you to get arrested. Um, but you could get arrested for resisting law enforcement in those situations, especially if you use any kind of force whatsoever to try to prevent or hinder your apprehension. If they had no intention at helping the officer out, arresting them when going to the car, let's say that the officer had to carry them to the car and they just were limp, could that be resisting law enforcement? I say they're just not compliant with being arrested, but they're not tensing up. They're not preventing the officer from putting the cuffs on them, but they're also not assisting with making it easy. I mean, I, I think that's the same answer as before. I mean, if you're dead fishing it, you're dead fishing it, basically. I mean, if they want to move you, then they have to move you. Um, but Yeah, it, a lot of times what's illegal and what's a good idea uh, aren't uh, mutually exclusive, right? Going completely limp when a police officer is trying to arrest you um, is not a very good idea. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is that your body is not meant to be drug around. Um, and the older I get, the more I realize how, uh, how hard everything in the world is that occasionally bumps into me. So you know, doing things like that make it significantly more likely that the protester is going to get hurt, that the police officer who has to try to carry somewhere between 100 and 200 pounds of dead weight by themselves is going to get hurt, um, I know there are some police officers who listen to this and there are some police officers who are in great shape and can certainly pick up 200 pounds of dead weight without much trouble. There are some who can't. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but if it's their job, they'll try and they'll try to do things that they're not physically capable of doing. And if they hurt themselves, the cop's not the one who's going to get the blame for it. It's the person who was making them carry 200 pounds of dead weight around. Here's the other thing. If you're going to engage in civil disobedience, everything I've read about it from the different people I've discussed who have practiced it suggests that you really should be welcoming the arrest, right? The, the point of the entire situation is to get arrested, to bring more attention to whatever cause it is that you're getting arrested for, right? So whether you go limp or you stand up and put your hands behind your back, you're getting arrested either way. Why make it worse for everyone when it was your goal to begin with? You know what I mean? So can you can you play dead fish and see what happens? Sure. Do I think it's a do I think it's illegal? Probably not. Do I think it's a good idea? Definitely not. <laughs> so with the stay-at-home orders in effect in Indianapolis for weeks now. A new picture has emerged around certain crimes in the city, specifically domestic violence. An IUPUI study found that domestic violence calls have increased significantly after schools and restaurant closures, and that they see that the increase is likely because people are at home together for longer periods of time. Could you define domestic violence for the listeners? Well, domestic violence, it's referring to a household family or household member. Basically, it's a battery between those two people. It's elevated um, or separated because of the relationship to the parties versus a regular, you know, a battery that could be somebody passed on the street or encountered at a bar. Or it, it's a way to denote the special relationship between the, the complaining witness and the, the accused. Are the penalties different for the different types of relationships if it was a family member opposed to a stranger? Well, 
yes and no. I mean, you know, if it's an A misdemeanor, domestic battery, it has the same potential penalties as an a, any other A misdemeanor. Uh, one thing, um, you know, at that speaking length of sentence, uh, fine, that kind of thing. Now, the thing with the domestic battery, if you have a conviction, that will affect your ability to possess a firearm in the future. Uh, you know, they're going to take stronger stance on, you know, protective orders, and no contact orders and things like that. Um, so, so yes and no, um, I guess is the answer. <laughs> Great lawyer answer. Is domestic <clears throat> violence the same as domestic battery? Domestic violence is what you'd call a, a catch-all term to describe several different kinds of crimes. Um, one is domestic battery. Uh, another is um, strangulation, uh, and then also typically invasion of privacy falls under into that category as well. Now, you can commit those crimes against people that aren't domestic partners, but the vast majority of times when that crime is committed, it is against a domestic partner. And so because of that, uh, they just all kind of fall into the same category. In Marion County, there are two specific uh, domestic violence courts who handle nothing but domestic violence uh, misdemeanors and level six felonies. And so they have all these different crimes that go into that courtroom. Um, and so it, it's kind of a catch-all term for domestic battery plus the other stuff. And what are the penalties for domestic violence from the smallest to the largest? Well, I mean, I was, it's the same thing. I mean, the lowest level is, I think, an A misdemeanor, and I would say the highest level could potentially go up to, what, an aggravated battery. So the standard, I mean, that's, they're, they are what they are. You know what I mean? If it's an A misdemeanor, it's an A misdemeanor. If it's a B or a, a level two or a level three, I mean, that's, so. And when you say A <clears throat> misdemeanor, does that mean time in jail, a fine? Any criminal offense can potentially put you in jail. Uh, the maximum sentence on an A misdemeanor is 365 days. So, yeah, the least serious crime that usually gets sort of grouped into domestic battery ends up being B misdemeanor battery, which um, carries a penalty between uh, zero and 180 days in the county jail. Um, you can also end up on probation for it. But um, any battery on a domestic partner or household member uh, is an A misdemeanor. Um, so even if it was only going to be a B misdemeanor, it gets enhanced to an A because of the relationship. Um, if you do that against the same person again, or if you do it again after you have a prior conviction for doing it, the second conviction is a level six felony. And then there are more serious offenses that happen between domestic partners, like C felony battery, aggravated battery, like Cassie mentioned. Um, and even when you get up into the high, higher level felonies, they stop considering the domestic nature of it, but you just get charged with that real serious felony. Um, you know, unfortunately, murder happens between domestic partners sometimes. So, I mean, realistically, that's the most serious offense that um, that happens or that gets charged, but um, they, there's a point as you get higher up into the ranges in Indiana law where they stop considering that, and it's just murder or aggravated battery. Um, but those things still can serve as aggravating factors at the sentencing hearing for those crimes, too. Um, the reason for that is there's a, a factor that causes judges to give out harsher sentences for people who are in positions of trust with each other, right? Um, so uh, my wife and I love each other. We trust each other. We don't expect either one of us to punch the other one in the face uh, or do something even worse to each other. And so uh, if I were to do it, I deserve a, a harsher sentence because I've violated her trust in that way, if that makes sense. And going back to something Cassie mentioned, um, you brought up guns and um, domestic violence. Does domestic violence uh, charges mean that someone would lose their gun rights? Prosecutors usually pursue a protective order when charges are filed, and that protective order will order the, per the accused not to possess a firearm while 
the charges are pending. If there is ultimately a conviction, yes, even a misdemeanor domestic battery conviction will result in termination of your gun rights. So if someone already is in possession of guns and a protective order was filed against them, do they have to surrender their weapons or like how does that work? They don't necessarily have to surrender them to the police, but they're supposed to have them, you know, removed from their home. Um, they're not supposed to be around and available to them. Yeah, they can't possess them. Um, but there are situations where uh, the court will order a person to turn their firearms over to um, the Indiana State Police. And and uh, if you if you show up there and you tell them, that's what's happened. They'll take your guns from you. <laughs> so do domestic violence goes hand in hand with protective orders, and those are still being filed online, even though most of the court's operations are, are shut down during this pandemic. What is a protective order? Is it the same thing as a restraining order and no contact order? What is a protective order and what kind of protections does that give someone? Well, it, it orders the person to stay away, and it kind of encompasses a, a no contact order as well. You can't physically be around the place. You can't contact. You can't have people do it on behalf. Um, I think as many victims have complained, you know, I mean, it's worth whatever shield the paper is if someone really has ill intent. But I think that that comes down if someone really has ill intent. What what does the paper, you know, what does the, you know, written law confine that person? Um, it's teeth in enhancing uh, future offenses. It can get someone taken into custody when they were, you know, and held during the rest of the pendency of the case. Um so, yeah, they're issuing them, and that's just a way to keep the two parties apart uh, during the pendency of the case and in, in hopes of keeping the complaining witness safe. Yeah, and people often use these different phrases for it, right? Protective order or no contact order or a restraining order. And in Indiana, they're all the same thing. Um, it's all an order from the judge uh, typically telling you to have no contact with a, uh, a person and to stay away from places you know they'll be, like their work and their home. So let's say you have a married couple who lives together and there was this domestic violence between the two and one of them files a protective order against another. How does that work when they're living in the same home? Does one have to leave? Certainly. Yeah, yeah. Some, somebody's got to find a new place to stay. Now, are there any defenses that one could use if um, someone was accused of violating a protective order? Well, you mean like an affirmative defense? Um, I mean, well, they, they have to prove it. Um, you know, it could be mistaken identity, um, you know, something like that. But, you know, it's, it's not a defense that the alleged victim reached out to you. Um, I've heard judges explain it as far as, you know, if you're, if you're shopping in the grocery store and you see him walk in, it is on you to walk away. Um, so, uh, that when that, when the judge issues that order, the judge considers that an order between the accused and the judge and the victim can't come in and interfere with that and give them a be like, well, the victim doesn't want this. Well, if the judge says it, the, the judge says it. I mean, the victim can pursue the judge to have them lift it, but um, that's not a defense. Yeah, and that is, I know we've talked about this before, that is probably the third largest misconception um, that, that I see in, in all the work I do, um, is people think that the no contact order works both ways. Um, so, uh, just to use an example to clarify it a little bit more, um, and, and I won't impugn my wife's character, so we'll pretend I'm the bad guy. Um, so if I, in fact, had punched my wife in the face and got charged with domestic battery because of that, and the court issued a no contact order, the order only applies to me. So I cannot contact her. And I can't have anybody else contact her on my behalf, except my lawyer, I think. Um, but she 
My wife can still do whatever she wants. She can text me three times a day. She can call me. She can ring me up and uh, call me names or tell me she loves me, whichever she wants. Um, and there is nothing I can do about it. And I can't respond. If I respond, I'm breaking the law. She's not. Unless I can prove she's harassing me or something like that. But even then, I can't respond. I'm under an order of the judge not to have any contact. That includes responding when she initiates the contact. Um, a lot of people I talk to, they think when a no contact order is entered, that means neither one of them can contact the other and they both have to stay away from each other. And that is uh, not the case. Not at all. Are no contact orders always initiated by the victim or does, does sometimes the, the state issue those on their, on their own? Well, the state will pretty much st start it uh, and, you know, the, they'll carry it. They can, f the state can, f you know, fight the victim in keeping that in place and the judge can order it over the objection of the complaining witness. Um, one thing, not only is it for protection of the physical person uh, or the parties, but it's also the state's protection of the case. The state also has an interest in their witnesses not being tampered with. Um, so that's another consideration that they are. But, I mean, that's a big misconception, the, the ability of the victim to drive that decision. Um, they play a role in their inputs considered, but that decision um, is with a prosecutor, at least initially. You know, it's, it's interesting that Cassie brings that up because I see that argument made a lot, actually, the, the uh, protecting the integrity of their case. Um, the state likes to make that argument for why no contact orders shouldn't be lifted. Although, if you read the no contact order statute, it lists the factors that the court is allowed to consider when deciding whether to issue you one issue a no contact order or not. And integrity of the state's case isn't anywhere in there. Um, so they like to come make that argument, but it is not actually anywhere in the statute um, that the, the court should consider that. Um, the state's case either has integrity or it doesn't. Uh, it's not fair to ask the impartial referee in the case to come down on one side or the other by tilting the scales to make it easier for the state to prove their case. Um, and the statute reflects that. But, you know, a smart prosecutor somewhere came up with that argument and uh, it's really taken hold. I hear it a lot. Well, and I think that the court does give some credence to it, especially in the courts where they see it all the time, because a lot of there's a, there's a higher frequency uh, within this type of case for the state's case to fall apart. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, it, it's uh, significantly higher. Uh, domestic violence cases in the domestic violence courts, um, and even in the other courts when they go to major felony, are are um, significantly more likely to fail. Um, and get dismissed because of non-cooperation yeah, of the witnesses. So what penalties or consequences does one face if they were accused of violating a protective or no-contact order? Yeah, that's a, that's a misdemeanor. Um, it's an A misdemeanor. It's called invasion of privacy. Um, that's a misconception I hear sometimes, too. People think that uh, if, if they told somebody to leave them alone and they don't, then they've committed invasion of privacy. And that's not true. You actually have to have the no contact order. Um, but it's, a, it's an A misdemeanor, and each instance is an A misdemeanor. And because they're misdemeanors, they are eligible to be stacked um, without any limitation, I don't think. Wow. Which means if I send my wife eight texts um, you know, at 2 in the morning after a no contact order has been issued, I get charged with eight counts of invasion of privacy. And in that situation, potentially could be looking at eight years in the county jail. Um, now, realistically, there are not a lot of judges who will sentence a person to eight years in their county jail because their county jail doesn't have that kind of room. But that is what could potentially happen. And uh, a second offense for it uh, is a level six felony. So it, it, it's one of those we were talking about a few episodes ago that, that gets stacked if you, if you have a prior conviction. 
So if there are certain um, penalties that are set in stone for um, breaking the law, like violating a protective order or no contact order, what benefit would an accused have at hiring an attorney? Well, I guess I would back up and uh, I'm confused as to what makes you think anything was set in stone. These are maximum and minimum ranges. They're the same as any other offense. There's a maximum and minimum range. Like if they say it's an A misdemeanor, it's 365 days. That's the maximum. It's like any other misdemeanor. It could be zero days and zero fine. Okay, so since it's not set in stone, there's a minimum and a maximum. Maybe hiring an attorney would help you get the minimum? Well, certainly. I mean, yeah, I mean, we're talking about a set of, you know, types of offenses. It's not any, like I said in the beginning, it's a misdemeanor. It's got a range. Each case is going to be evaluated individually. Yes, of course, your attorney can advocate to minimize uh, the damage, assuming there's a conviction. And of course, an attorney would help you build a defense and present that offense to fight the case if there are grounds to do that and the client wishes you to do that. Yeah. And more so in domestic violence cases than regular cases, it's it's kind of important that you get someone who understands the system for the court you're in. Because judges have very different policies for how they deal with non-cooperating witnesses in these types of cases. Um, in Marion County, if you set it for deposition and they don't show up two or three times, um, usually the state the judge will end up excluding the witnesses and then the state doesn't have a case they can try, so they have to dismiss it. But in other counties, they don't have to, you know, they don't have to do that. There's no law that says they have to. It's just a discovery sanction. Um, and so in other counties, the judges don't necessarily do that. Instead, they'll issue a warrant for the person's arrest for not showing up, not obeying the court subpoena. Um, because you are typically served a subpoena to appear at those depositions. So um, in those cases, you really want an attorney that understands the system that your case is in, um, because it is uh, important to understand how the judge is going to deal with your case. And with that kind of issue in particular, it varies a lot. And so you want you know, you, you want somebody who's been through that and has that experience in the court that you're in. In Indianapolis last week, there was a police officer who died after responding to a domestic violence call. Yeah. I assume you know the, the officer that I'm talking, well, not personally know, but you know of the officer that I'm talking about because she's been on the news a lot lately. Um, with domestic violence, do... Are they typically like linked to other types of violence and charges? Uh, well, so let, let's start with saying, you know, obviously our, our condolences out, go out to uh, Brian Leith's family and everyone else, including all the police officers who've been affected by your death. Um, I have not read a lot about it, but from what I have read, she seemed like a wonderful person. Um, I know she had a young child, and I'm sure she's got some family. I think they're in law enforcement, too. So um, please don't take, you know, anything we're saying today as some type of slight or insult where we're talking about it. But um, but we, you know, obviously it's it's a terrible situation, and, um, and no one here wishes that any of this had ever happened. We certainly um, uh, wish that none of this sort of thing had happened. I, I don't think there is necessarily, however, a lot of um, link between domestic violence crimes and other types of crimes. Um, it's the kind of thing that, unfortunately, a wide range of people can commit, um, th that being domestic violence, um, because it typically happens in moments of anger, and we are all susceptible to being angry and to doing things when we're angry that we regret. Um, so you see tip, you know, people that you would not typically expect to get arrested um, pick up those types of cases too, um, but also the other way around. And um, it's, 
it's difficult to draw really any conclusions about a person based solely on, you know, what you know, being arrested for that, if it makes any sense. Now, being angry and reacting in the heat of the moment, is that a potential defense for a domestic violence charge? Only if it, I mean, if I, I haven't seen it as a domestic violence charge. I mean, you're kind of going down the vein of what would be like heat of passion defense to uh, a, a murder. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, uh, only if what you were charged with was, was murder. Um, and then it would just be reducing it to voluntary manslaughter. Um, but uh, there is no defense for domestic battery because you were mad. Um, whether you're mad or not, the law expects you to not punch other people in the face or choke them. Um, you know, uh, so it's, um, so no, I guess is the short answer to your question. I know this is a pretty vague question, but what are some pen potential defenses for being charged with domestic violence? I mean, you can challenge the relationship you challenge whether it occurred um you know mistaken identity the seriousness of the injury um you know it's not much i mean you get you have the extra element of the nature of the relationship so that gives you extra defenses there but the same defenses that would apply to any battery could potentially apply here and then you know, they have to also prove that relationship. So if you could disprove that relationship. Yeah, more so than, than normal cases, domestic violence cases come down to the credibility of a witness. Um, and that's because typically they're not committed in public in front of a lot of people who will see them. Typically they're committed uh, in um, you know, confined spaces inside houses where uh, it's just a husband and a wife or a boyfriend and a girlfriend. There's usually not a whole lot of other people there um, that, that will witness it and then come to court later and talk about it. So the credibility of that one witness, who is usually also the victim, the alleged victim, um, end up being very important when those cases go to trial. Um, and you know, they, they go to trial about the same amount as every other kind of case, um, maybe even a little less, actually, because more of them get dismissed than a normal case. So let's say cops were called to a home because neighbors heard some commotion going on, and the cops get there and someone has some injuries on them. Does that victim have to press charges, or do the cops have the authority to take the person that caused those injuries away. The victim can choose to report or not choose to report. There's no, that's, I don't know, I don't know if there's a jurisdiction that actually puts that much control in the state or if that's a complete fallacy generated by entertainment television. Um, certainly, if the police believed that they had enough evidence to arrest someone, without that witness, they could, but I mean, just as a general, it's a case by case basis. And just, I mean, you're not providing me with enough information to say whether I thought that that rose to the level of probable cause for the suspected offense at the time, potentially. Um, if the state can make their case without the complaining witness, they will try to do that. Um, because of the circumstances that uh, Jake just described, these cases are less likely to have that other evidence. But if it exists, they certainly can pursue uh, prosecution of a case without that person cooperating. Yeah, yeah, they, they can do that. And um, it's it's difficult to say, for us to say that they will or they won't arrest a person because we don't see the cases where the people don't get arrested. Right? They may exist, it may happen all the time, and it may not. We don't know because when people don't get arrested, they don't call us. Uh, so for us to say the police do always do this or don't always do this or even tell you how often um, is kind of impossible because we'd be using confirmation bias to sort of uh, to tell you about it in our experience, but we only see the ones they file. So um, we don't know, but they certainly can arrest a person 
just because their significant other has bruises um, and and they got called there on a commotion. Now, it will depend on other factors and you know whether or not they have some reason to believe it had just happened. Um, but if it did, um, you know, they, they probably have probable cause. And usually when the police have probable cause to arrest you, they arrest you. Um, and they do that for a couple of reasons. One is they don't want husband further beating on wife. Uh, the second is they don't want to get sued by wife's family after husband, uh, beats her to death. Um, so I think usually when the police have probable cause to arrest a, a, a person in a domestic situation, they, they do it. Um, just to make sure that there's not going to be any more violence that day. And that's where, you know, the police is, police's primary role is safety, is safety. And it's not, um, you know, the, we as defense attorneys like to uh, beat the drum of violating people's rights. Um, but safety is their first concern. Um, and I think, you know, as an average citizen, you know, we can ag agree with that. You know, as a defense attorney, that may be something else. But um, like you said, you know, you don't want someone to get hurt. Um, this is the second of the last three officers killed in the line of duty that were killed during domestic um, incidences. It's one of those things that a lot of people, you know, oh, it's just a misdemeanor, this, or the other, but why the state and law enforcement take it so seriously is because it can jump from a low-level misdemeanor to murder uh, in the flip of a light switch. Uh, and, and those are very, very dangerous situations for officers to be going into. At that, that point, they don't know, you know, is the person who was calling crying for their help, is that person going to turn and attack them while they're trying to protect that person from the attack, you know, the, the alleged attacker. So it's, it's, it's a very, very volatile uh, situation um, and very dangerous for everybody. So there was a Vigo County deputy sheriff that was arrested this past week on domestic violence charges. Uh, he was in an altercation with his son. The wife got involved uh, trying to pull the, the deputy off the son. And in turn, she got kicked and she tried to call the police and the deputy sheriff tried to uh, take the phone out of her hand. The cops did end up coming and arresting him and he was uh, put in jail on uh, preliminary misdemeanor charges of domestic battery and interfering with reporting of a crime. So I just find it interesting that um, domestic violence can extend beyond just the normal public and the police officers can be victim of it themselves. Yeah, there was, there was a more serious case in, in Marion County, I think a couple of years ago, um, where, uh, actually there've been a couple of real serious ones over the last 10 years. There was one where a police officer killed his police officer wife. Um, I think that was, it was six years ago, I think. It was around the time. It was a little bit before I left the prosecutor's office. Um, and there was another one where um, a police officer had been accused of domestic violence, and the detective was investigating it, and the police officer shot the detective that was investigating the case. Um, so there have been a couple of real kind of wild ones over the last few years. Obviously, every time it happens, it's um, a tragedy, but domestic violence is a thing that, like I said, stretches beyond sort of the normal, what you would normally imagine, because it happens quickly and because it's usually done in a moment of anger. Um, and people, you know, they make decisions when they're angry that they uh, tend to regret. So also this past week, Florida man he was arrested on a charge of domestic violence by strangulation. Um, him and his girlfriend were found naked in a car yeah. wrestling outside of a Florida mall over a <laughs> pee napkin. Wait, over uh, what? A, a pee napkin. Apparently after they had sex, the woman had a pee, so she stepped out of the car, peed, wiped herself with a napkin, threw it in the car, and it hit 
the guys. Oh. And then he apparently didn't like it to the point of strangulation. And this happened uh, in Florida probably like every day of the week last week. But yeah. <laughs> so Ooh. this brings up a strangulation charge. Is Can someone be charged with strangulation in Indiana? And what's the line between that and attempted murder? Well, yes, there is a strangulation charge, and it's uh, inhibiting the airway. Um, I think it has to call, cause loss of consciousness. Um, well, an attempted murder is something that just doesn't get charged very much. Um, you would think as an average person, well, if you're strangling them, obviously your intent is to murder them. Um, but that is in that element has to be proven. They very rarely charge it. Same as same as a, I guess an average person would be like, well, you fired a gun multiple times at that person. How is that not attempted murder? Um, and they just don't. They just don't charge that. I, 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 I never was a screening at that level at the prosecutor side, so I don't know what goes into that. I just know it's 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 a much harder harder charge because you have to prove that intent element. Yeah, so the there is a difference between strangulation and attempt murder. Strangulation is a level six felony. Um, attempt murder is a, a level one felony, and I think there is a recognition in the law. The law recognizes that there's a difference between uh, choking someone and trying to kill them. Um, sometimes, and I'm not I'm not speaking from experience, but uh, I can imagine a situation where you choke someone because you have not been trained appropriately on how to express your anger and disappointment, um, but that uh, you're not trying to kill them. You're just trying to You've just chosen a very, very poor way to express your dissatisfaction. A very, very poor way. Um, whereas to choke someone and it really be an attempt murder, I mean, you probably have to choke them into unconsciousness and maybe even further. Um, people don't realize this, uh, and TV makes it worse, but it's actually really, really hard to choke someone to death. Um, it is, uh, it requires you placing enough pressure on their arteries to prevent blood flow to their brain until they lose consciousness. And then for roughly four to eight minutes after they lose consciousness, wow. to keep the blood out of their brain until their brain dies. Um, because that's what keeps your brain alive is the blood flowing into it. So you have to do it for a long time to actually kill a person. Um, and you know, so it, choking somebody for 30 seconds or 15 seconds, probably not going to get it done, right? But, I mean, yeah, if you sat there and choked someone for five minutes, well, that sounds more like you specifically were trying to kill them. Right. Um, so it, it just depends on the, I think the length of time, a lot of times, uh, it also helps. Sometimes the prosecution will latch onto the things the person says while they're doing it. You know what I mean? And I can't believe you did this to me is a lot different than, uh, bitch, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. Right. Uh, in terms of what, yeah. Uh, it, and when a person expresses an intent like that, a lot of times they latch onto that and they'll charge a temp murder in that situation. But um, when they don't have something like that, when it's just, uh, you know, he, he choked me for 10 seconds um, and I couldn't breathe, uh, you know, that's not usually going to get charged as an attempted murder. Well, thank you, Jake and Cassie. That wraps up this episode. All right. Thanks, Terry. And thank you for listening to Tales from the Brown Desk. Remember, while we may discuss legal issues and provide information regarding the law to our listeners, we do not intend to create an attorney-client relationship with any listener. Our advice may not be applicable to some legal issues. Please consult with an attorney you have hired to review your legal situation before you attempt to apply the things we have said to your case. If you'd like to call us and schedule a consultation, feel free to give us a call at Rigney Law at 
430-7370. If you'd like to send us a question for our next podcast, please email Terry at T-E-R-I at RigneyLawIndy.com. Please title your email podcast question and mention your name, at least your first name, and your hometown. The attorneys at Rigney Law do not comment on their current pending cases. Nothing we have said in this podcast is a comment on a case we are currently working on, even if you're from Florida. Bye, everyone.